Hey, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study, live. And when I say live, I mean we're live outside this evening. So um, I'm hoping you're gathering around. I do have my coffee right here, so I got it. Let me get a... Oh, yeah, good and hot. Got my coffee, got my Bible, got my Bible study book, got my uh, phone here. And what I want to encourage you to do is to share this on your page okay so get ready to do that get your coffee get whatever you need to um be ready for the nice bible study again last week i shared it's going to be a little bit uh, uh different uh this evening because we're going to be uh doing it out here doing live we got we won't have any songs. Uh, I know that'll disappoint you because we have several of them that are really good in, in doing that. But uh, this is Property of America, you can see this evening. And so we're live this evening from Newberry, Michigan. So we're clear up in the UP, the Upper Peninsula part of, um, part of Michigan. And we are here to bring Bible study to you wherever you are. Okay, so uh, ready get started on whatever you need to uh, have. Uh, get your coffee, get your Bible, get your pen, get everything going. As people get on, start to tell everybody hi. Uh, we welcome you this evening. Uh, it's been, the high today was 66 degrees where we are. Uh, it's been cloudy. We got rain last night. It's been cool all day. Uh, I'm not sure how hot it is where you are. Maybe it's the same temperature or maybe it's less. But anyway, we invite you to, to come alongside us this evening. And so uh, announcements this uh, evening is going to be, uh, we do have the, the lighthouse, the Pomona Food Pantry. will be tomorrow from 1 to 4. So we are excited about that. we got a great group of people that are going to be there to uh, put away the food that's coming in and to distribute the food that we've got this evening that's going to come in tomorrow. So... Uh, it's going to be a, a great time, so we invite you to uh, uh, be in prayer for that. If you're not one of the ones that are going to be there, but be in prayer and, and just excited about what kind of ministry opportunities that we have uh, through that, uh, sharing the love of Christ. And so uh, this evening we're going to be in John chapter 2. Now, I do encourage you to uh, get started on that, uh, get turned to that uh, place in your Bible, uh, get your notepad and pens and everything ready to go. And we're going to start this evening with some some prayer, uh, some prayer time, and and so with that, as we begin, uh, uh, we want to remember Tanya. She has uh, surgery tomorrow. Um, so remember her and her and Scott. Uh, remember uh, Donna Myers. She has surgery coming up here. Uh, some some test, and so we want to remember uh, them as well. Uh, her and Joe. Uh, Mila had surgery today, and all went well. That came through the prayer chain. So. <laughs> Excuse me, if you haven't heard that, uh, she's home and recovering, so that is a, uh, a real blessing. Um, we still want to pray for each one of the states and their, uh, the things they do now through the, the COVID-19, uh, the process of that. Uh, we know there's still some uncertainty about when school will start, what school is going to look like, what's going on for the kids, for the teachers, for administration, and and we do want to lift up, uh, continue to pray for our president and vice president, for our state uh, officials, for our local officials, for our county officials. And I know many of them, when they were elected to the office this last time, had no idea that they were going to be uh, facing some of the things that they're facing today. And so we want to really lift them up in prayer that uh, the decisions they make would be ones that God would uh, uh, lead upon their hearts and, and do the best to. So. Hey, we are super glad that you've joined us, whether you are live right now or watching this in the days to come. Uh, we're so glad you joined us, so glad for the opportunity to be able to uh, uh, minister the good news of Jesus Christ uh, with you and with uh, uh, those that are out there, with those available. So uh, this evening won't be as long as normal because of the lack of, uh, of uh, music and the different things that we do. So as we begin this evening, uh, why don't you join me in prayer? Well, Lord, we do thank you again this evening just for an opportunity to uh, to come to you, to bring these prayers to you. And Father, we, we're so thankful today that uh, Mila came through surgery and she's
she's home and recovering. And, and Father, I think now of Tanya, she undergoes surgery tomorrow, that you would just be with both her and Scott and, and just bless them with, uh, with the outcome. Uh, we know we've, we've seen your hand in the midst of this all the way through. So we just ask that you would uh, uh, just continue uh, that opportunity of ministry to them and through them. And Father, we pray for uh, Donna Myers as she has some uh, tests coming up on uh, next Monday that you would uh, be with her and Joe as they go through those and uh, just provide a, a blessing for that as well. Uh, Father, we pray for our elected officials. We pray for our first responders. We pray for the doctors and nurses. We pray for all the, the hospital staff, the, the doctors, uh, offices and those staffs and just all the things that uh, as this uh, virus seems to continue to uh, um, be just uh, you know an unprecedented time but father we know that it didn't catch you by uh, off guard it didn't catch you by chance you knew exactly what was going on and so father we ask that you would use these things uh, uh, for your ability uh, in our lives and so father this evening as we look into your word this evening in John chapter 2 we just ask that you would reveal yourself to us uh, Lord, that you would uh, strengthen us through your word, and Father, that we would uh, uh, glean what you have for each one of us this evening. Uh, Father, we thank you for your creation, and we thank you for the opportunity to uh, minister to one another, and just the need opportunities we have even this evening. And so, Lord, we just give you praise, we thank you, and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, hey, we're going to be in John chapter 2. Uh, Good evening, everybody, as everybody gets on and starts uh, starts watching, starts uh, joining. Uh, so it's, uh, like I said, it's uh, we're in the UP, we're in Newberry. You can look that up on your phone or tablet later and see where we are. We're way up north. Uh, cool temperatures, 66 degrees. Uh, we're actually, don't tell them, because I'm not promoting them, but we're, we're sitting out back at McDonald's right now, hooked up on the internet. And so that's how we've <laughs> connected to join with you this evening. So, hey, anyway, we're going to be in John chapter 2. So, if you'd turn there, uh, we get going this evening. You know, last week we looked at uh, uh, John chapter 1 and just really who God is, uh, who he's brought through Jesus. And we saw that as Jesus dwells in us, then the Holy Spirit ministers to us. And so, we've seen the, the Trinity in action last week. And so, this week, uh, we move on into John chapter 2. And, of course, this is one of my favorite books in the Bible uh, because uh, in chapters, because this is one of the ones I felt like the Lord had really uh, spoke uh, for the very first time uh, to me in a mighty way. And so uh, I got my, my notebook here, I got my Bible, and so as we begin this evening, uh, you know, our, our main idea, our main goal this evening is to uh, let you know that, that uh, Jesus is, is God's word to us. Uh, He's superior to all the other answers that we, we have and look for. And, and so each one of us have this uh, inner missing within us. And we're trying to fill it with all these things that the world has to offer. And none of those things can ever fill it because uh, God has created us in such a way that Jesus is that answer. And so this evening, we hopefully, we can kind of connect that and see that. And so as we go into John chapter 2... You know, one of the important aspects of John chapter 2 is that Jesus changed, changed the water into wine. And so that's going to be something that we look at, and that's something that we're going to answer this evening. Why did Jesus change that water into wine? And so we're going to show Jesus' superiority uh, in, in meeting our deepest needs. We're going to see that uh, our uh, frequent and incomplete attempted solutions to trying to fill those needs in our own lives just doesn't work. And so the Bible, it's our authoritative guide for life, uh, for ministry, for uh, just all that uh, we have. And hopefully this evening it will help in develop and growing our relationship uh, with Jesus, with uh, one another, and it will continue to help with our, with our faith. And so Jesus in this chapter 2 turned the water into wine. Uh, as we go on a little bit in chapter 2, we're going to see that he also challenged the temple worship that was going on at that time. And we're going to see that Jesus is uh, superior. He's sufficient for all of those things, uh, all the attempts that we try to do to fill those needs. And so one of the questions that we tried to answer last week was, who is this Jesus? Okay, that's what we looked at last week. Jesus is divine. Uh, he's life. He's the light. 
He's the Lamb of God. And Jesus, as we've seen in uh, John chapter 1, he calls people to follow him. And he still does that today. He calls us to follow him. Along with the disciples, uh, Jesus is now ready to embark on ministry. And so that's where we come to John chapter 2. Uh, so who is Jesus? Uh, the answer to that question uh, leads us right into where we're headed. Uh, the second chapter of John contains two remarkable events in Jesus' life. Uh, first, he turned the water into wine, and second, he turned over the table of the money changers. <clears throat> he turned over the tables in the temple. And so when we look carefully at each one of these episodes in Jesus' ministry, we see that he is indeed the Son of God. We see the difference that Jesus makes in the lives of all of us, and we're going to see that he's superior in, in, in meeting all of the needs that we have. Okay, so the Gospel of John, it emphasizes the importance of what is called signs. Uh, John, some of your versions might even call them miracles. And these signs were miracles that Jesus performed. Um, they were not to draw attention to themselves, not the miracle or not them sign itself, but to show who Jesus really is. And these signs were pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. He's the fulfillment of all of those uh, religious expectations, all of those things that had went on all the years before. And so the miracles are the signs of Jesus. They, they, they point to Jesus. Uh, the first sign we see is it happened in a small town in Galilee at a place called Cana. Apparently, Jesus knew the family that was there because they were having a wedding party. And so Jesus, uh, his disciples, uh, his mother, and lots of others were, were, were attending this wedding. In the first century, uh, wedding celebrations, they would last for a week. They would last for seven days. And the host was expected to, uh, was expected to provide meals and drinks for all the people that was there for seven days. And I think, man, I have five daughters, five weddings that would last a week. And so I'm eternally grateful that we don't do it that way anymore, right? Uh, it's enough to prepare for a wedding the way it is now, but I couldn't imagine feeding and filling all the guests uh, for a week, for seven days. So any of you that know me that are going to come to my daughter's weddings, just know that uh, it's not going to be week long, okay? Uh, so, so don't give them any ideas. Uh, don't get them excited about it uh, because it's not going to take place. And so, again, I'm, I'm grateful to the Lord for, for changing that. So anyway, here we are. We're at, we're at Canaan. Uh, there's a wedding going on. Uh, Jesus, his disciples, his family, his friends. Uh, uh, lots of other people are there at this time, and they're they're hanging around. And right in the midst of all that had went on, <clears throat> the wine had run out. And so Jesus' mother, she comes to him, and she asks him to do something that was really just kind of unheard of. She asks him to um, replenish the wine that was gone. And Jesus said, you know, woman, why do you involve me? It's not my time. So if you look at John chapter 2, verse 4, Jesus says, Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. Now, I will agree that I never talked to my mother that way. Uh, I had enough sense in my head to know that if I called my mother woman, I either wouldn't be looking out of that eye or I would be looking up from the floor to see what she looked like from a distance. Uh, you did not, that was not a thing that you called, that was not a thing you did. And really, in this answer, we can see that uh, knowing the situation and the times and the setting, Jesus wasn't insensitive either when he said that. Okay, so <clears throat> Jesus' mother had asked for wine. Uh, Jesus used the question to talk about his eternal significance. 
his time has not yet come, but boy, it, it's got to be close, you know. And so Jesus did then what his mother asked, but the concern of the story isn't the wedding, it isn't the wine, and it isn't the woman's request. These are part of the signs, and the sign points to Jesus. Jesus is the new wine. And to the Jews, wine symbolized the joy of a new life. And the wine had run out, and so this new life was needed. Uh, the life was old, it was inferior, and Jesus has now come. And so that's who Jesus is. He's the one that brings anew. And so Jesus is the new life that comes through God. And we take Jesus into our lives, we find that Jesus is the fulfillment of our longings. He's the joy for which our hearts yearn. He fills that void that we have and don't know where to turn. And so the first thing we notice is that Jesus said something about the hour. The hour has not come. The time hasn't come. And so the, according to the Gospels, if you look through there, you see that there's about three years left in Jesus' earthly ministry, in his earthly life. And though the time hasn't come, it's close, but it hasn't come yet. But Jesus knew that his life would, would soon be over. He would give his life on the cross, and he would do it willingly. Nobody would make Jesus do it. Nobody would take his life, and Jesus gave it because that is why he came. And so Jesus came to show the people who God is, how they can have a relationship with him, and that God loves them. And so sometimes we picture, you know, Jesus being taken to the cross um, against his will. You know, we think about the Roman authorities, how they come to arrest him at night. We think about the religious leaders. Uh, we think about the soldiers. And somehow all that seems to be in control. But according to the Gospel of John, there's nothing further from the truth. The Lamb of God willingly laid down his life for you and for me. And at any time, he could have came down off of that cross and just wiped out all that was there. But it would have left that void still for us today. And so an important detail here is the amount of new wine that Jesus made. There were six water pots, and six is an incomplete number. That's an incomplete Hebrew number. And so the religious faith of the Old Testament is fulfilled in the new wine of Jesus. Jesus filled six ceremonial pots, water pots, with new wine. Each one of those pots would have held probably 30 gallons. And so we're talking about a big celebration. And yeah, it made me think, you know, have you ever been to one of those weddings where they serve finger food? And you think, man, if, if nobody was looking, you know, and I had my plate, I'd put about six of those things on there and kind of cover it up with a napkin and sneak over to the side so I could have a meal you know, finger snacks. I'm not sure what that, you know, what that is. And so here these people were, they were, they were eating, they were drinking, and they'd come to the end of the wine. And so when Jesus filled these six water pots, he, he placed himself as the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. He understood that life and, and the joy that he brings is beyond all of our expectations. Some of the New Testament scholars uh, say that the water Jesus turned into wine was actually from a well, and so it shows that they were drawing out the old and completely making it new. And so whether that water was from a well or whether they got it from other pots, they, anyway, they filled six 
large clay water pots. And the important truth is that Jesus is showing his fulfillment in meeting the needs. And so Jesus also performed a, a, a sign of revealing himself and who it is. Jesus hired a, a steward, or the Jews, I'm sorry, the Jews hired a steward who would, who would consummate the marriage. They would follow through. They would keep everything up and going, and they would keep everything in hand and here right in the middle of everything. They were out of something to drink. You just couldn't run to the store at that time. You just couldn't run and go fill something up. Jesus took care of that for them. It allowed the, the parents, it allowed the family, it allowed the guest to celebrate without having to worry about what was going on. And then in verse 10, if you'll look at that, chapter 2, verse 10. Everyone brings out the choice wine first, then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you've saved the best until now. And so the lesson here we see is just, is, is truth. The faith of the Old Testament was a worthy faith. We learn so much about God from it from people like Abraham and Sarah and Ruth, David and Solomon. And they encourage our faith, but as wonderful as those 39 books in the Old Testament are, there are the, the best are, are yet to come. And so Jesus came as the best. Jesus is that new wine. He fulfills the expectations of the Old Testament and he brings the most complete expression of, of love and, and joy and faith to us today. And so after Jesus turned the water into wine, he, he traveled from Cana through Capernaum into the city of Jerusalem. The city was packed with Jewish pilgrims who had come to celebrate the feast of the Passover. The Passover celebrated in the spring it's the annual remembrance of how the Jews were in captured in Egypt and how God had released them from that captivity. He freed them from the bondage of Egypt. And so that Jewish exodus then was the continuing reminder of how God saved them and brought them out. And so when Jesus arrived at the temple in Jerusalem, he found the people selling cattle and <coughs> sheep and dove, and they were uh, uh, changing money from different currencies into what needed to be. And, and uh, right there at the, at the temple, the money changers sat by there. And so those people who had traveled from afar, they had come in, and so many times now they would not bring the things that they needed but yet they would just bring money to buy what was there and so they were brought in with uh, increased prices you might call it price gouging today they charged them to change the money over to different currency and it reminds me you know uh, for multiple years in the 90s and early 2000s, we went to Mexico on mission trip, and we would take our money down there. And once we got there, we would go to the the bank uh, right at the border of Texas, and we would get there in time to go in and exchange our money. Because if you went to the stores, or uh, there were even stores that exchanged money, they they charged you an excessive rate just to change your money from the American dollar to the peso. And so that was really what was taking place right in the temple. They were gouging the people. They were not bringing their sacrifices in. And so when, when Jesus arrived at the temple, he found this going on. There were people selling. They were buying. They were money chamber changes. And, and all this was going on right at the time when they were supposed to be celebrating one of the greatest things of, of God 
delivering them from the bondage of sin and death. And so this buying and selling, as, as, as Jesus looked, it did not make him happy. In fact, Jesus, uh, John says that Jesus even made a whip of cords and drove the merchants out, their animals out of the temple, and overturned the tables, if you look at verse 16. Get out of here, he said. How dare you turn my father's house into a market. <clears throat> and that's exactly what had taken place. So the account of, of, of Jesus here in the temple reminds us that <clears throat> there are some things that demand our focus. And there's opposition out there. And when worship, the very central simple thing of, of what worship is is trivialized then there's times where we need to speak out when the worship of the living God becomes self promotion then it's time that we say something it's amazing that some of the most beautiful things that we have can be abused Worship itself is a, is a beautiful word. It represents a gift that we have of ourselves giving to God for what God has done for us. And that's really what worship is about. And it's sad when we market worship like some type or form of entertainment. We go to church so we can watch the worship team perform before us. And that's not at all what scriptural worship is about. And when we do that, then the focus on God is lost. And what Jesus did in the temple was more than an act itself. It really was the sign. You move on through there and you go to verse 19. And Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. <clears throat> if you're standing there and you hear Jesus say that, you look up at the temple and you think, this building has been under construction for 46 years. How could Jesus build a temple like this in three days? And if he could, <coughs> excuse me, why hadn't he already? And so what the Jewish listeners at that time didn't understand was that when Jesus was using the word temple, he wasn't talking about the building he was talking about this. He was talking about this shell in which we live. That's how Jesus was going to do it. He, he, he changed the meaning on it. Jesus wasn't talking about a new worship center for them. He wasn't talking about a new building <coughs> where people would come and sing and praise and listen to God. That's not what he was talking about. This new building was not a temple that was going to be made with human hands. The temple was Jesus. That's where worship is to be tuned in to. Destroying the temple and it being rebuilt in three days, he was talking about his own death and resurrection. And here we see it right in John chapter 2. The Gospel of John also tells us that, just like the disciples, they didn't understand the deeper meanings of the things that Jesus was explaining to them. And it really wasn't until after his resurrection that a lot of those things they really understood. 
I hear a lot of times, you know, I say, do you understand? You know, you'll, you'll hear me, you know, preaching from the pulpit. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm saying? And just like Jesus, we want you to know that we want you to understand what we're saying. Some of the congregation nod their heads. Some of the congregation say amen. And others just continue to stare in the space. Or they're looking at the back of their eyelids checking for cracks. You know what I'm saying, right? Okay. <clears throat> so those of us who, who preach like to be understood. It's not a compliment to leave the sanctuary on Sunday morning and, and somebody say, you know, that was a very theological, well-expressed statement of a sermon that you made this morning, Pastor. Too bad I didn't understand a thing you were saying. You know, that is not my goal or my desire ever, and it's not Jesus either. He wanted everyone to understand, and that's why when I preach, I really want you to understand the gospel, understand what's going on. So in this gospel of John, Jesus spoke about profound things, about listeners, about his disciples. And part of the reason that Jesus talked in the ways that he did was so that his hearers to him would be focused on what he was saying. He talked about nature. He talked about work. He talked about the things that they knew. So when he was talking to them, they were listening and hearing, and they related those thoughts and processes right to what Jesus was saying. He wanted them to comprehend. He wanted them to understand. So really to to put it another way, Jesus spoke about eternal things in a way that people who were thinking about earthly things could understand. And so that's one of the fascinating aspects of the Gospel of John. Most of the time when people read this last part of John chapter 2, all they see is a, a Jesus who is supposed to be God who was upset because there were commerce going on in the sanctuary. And you know, while we may not like to sell tapes or things like that in our in our churches, you know, when we have music groups come or whatever, in John chapter 2, that is not what he's talking about. What he's saying in John chapter 2 is that Jesus is divine. Jesus is, in fact, God. He is the new temple. He is the new wine of our faith. He is the completeness because in the old, the sixth was incomplete, but the seventh made it new. The new temple is where we meet, is where we worship God. And that's where God calls us to give our lives to him. See, and Jesus calls each one of us by name. And he says, what I want is for you to dedicate your life to me. I want you to give up the things of the world. I want you to give up trying to fill your life full of the things that the world has to offer, those things that will never fill you. While this temple that Jesus talked about then, the temple would be destroyed in time, but not the way that they were talking about that day. The third day, the temple would rise. He would be complete, and he would be alive. And he would have paid the payment for our sin, and so redemption now is offered. And so it's an amazing thought. And so our temples as, as Christians is that we should let Jesus be revealed 
in us. Well, having a place to worship is important. Something far more important is there. And, that's and so we worship the person of Jesus. And nothing else can destroy that. Nothing else can tear that away. Nothing else can, can take that away from where we are. And we live in a world that people seek various answers to something to fulfill their lives. I can't pay my bills. I, I can't get through this health thing. I can't get through this marriage thing. I can't get through this relationship thing. I can't keep a job. I can't find a job. I can't get a good thing. I can't understand our government. I can't understand, you know, my family. I can't understand my parents. I can't understand. And so all of these things that we're, we're dealing with all these difficulties and we try to find answers for them and we try to fill ourselves with things that maybe will either make the answer easier or take the answer away. We seek all these practical solutions for solving the problems of life. Very few will seek a spiritual guidance, the one that has fulfillment of all the answers in our life. We want to just feel good. And that's what Jesus is not about. Jesus is one that gives us a feel better eternally kind of answer. And a lot of those answers that we come up with often have nothing to do with what we really look for in Jesus. And so John chapter 2 really reminds us that there are answers to the questions that you have. And the answer is Jesus. Jesus is sufficient for meeting all your needs. He's supreme. He's powerful. He's authoritative. And he's the need that fills that innermost desire of your heart. And so as we look at John chapter 2 this evening, we see that, you know, on the third day, you know, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, that was like the resurrection day. A wedding took place seven days. Six is that incomplete number. They were in Canaan, Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, the woman who had given birth to him. So was his disciples, those he had called. And they were all there, and his mother said, you know, when they ran out of wine, she said, do what her son says. In an earthly fashion, that's what we're called to do. Those six stone clay water pots were setting aside empty, and that's what you and I are today. We're just empty. And we need to stop looking for the answers ourselves and allow Jesus to provide the answer for us. You know, as we close this evening, I want you to think about what signs in your life have, have pointed you to Jesus. Have you ran from those signs? Are you listening to those signs? And if you stop trying to fill yourself with all of these other things and you filled yourself with Jesus, what could possibly happen? And so do we still have signs today? Yeah, I, I believe we do. Can those signs be ordinary? Can they be spectacular? Yeah, all those things, because that's, that's who Jesus is. And all those things point us to him. And sometimes when those difficulties come into our life, what he's, he's allowing that to take place in hopes that we'll turn to him for the solution. So what evidence does your life give that you've turned your life over to Jesus? 
Is there evidence at all? Not that we have to say something, but does our life point others to Jesus? And then as you think about this this evening, think about what places in your life have been a, a, a crucial part of your journey of faith? You know, journeying out with the family into creation, spending time with them. Is that something that does? Maybe it does and maybe it, maybe it doesn't. But I know there's some places that have been crucial in your life that have led you to the point of even listening to this this evening or in the days to come. And I would encourage you to jot those, excuse me, jot those down. And then as I said earlier, I want you to think about what it means to really worship God. Not a created environment that's place in the perfect sanctuary with the perfect lights and the perfect music so that if all those things don't come together, you just don't worship. Our lives are supposed to be about worship. Seeing God and reacting to Him. Worship is about an audience of one, not about a group, a collective of people together. It's not that we can't do it that way, but we can't expect to do it always that way. God calls us as individuals to worship Him. And as he went into the temple and he turned over the money changers, what he's telling us is that there are some things in our lives that we probably need to turn over, get rid of, stop doing, stop being a part of. You know, don't dust off your Bible on the way to church. Use it throughout the week. Don't come up there and change money, you know, to just do whatever needs to be done. Have a planned time of giving and offering that helps support the ministries like at North Baptist Church to help support the ministries that, that we're a part of. Be a part of that. And stop trying to fill your things with everything that the world has to offer and knowing that Jesus is really the answer. So hopefully this evening you've come up with some answers and some new things to start on for you, for your life. Next week we're going to be in John chapter 3. So we invite you to uh, read ahead. Come alongside as we probably are going to look at that guy by the name of Nicodemus and talk about be born again. That'll probably come up. So we want, want to think about that throughout this week. Hey, I want you to know that i uh, uh, got a guy filling in for me on Sunday morning, and they're going to be on Facebook Live, and they're going at 1030 on Sunday morning, and there's going to be uh, live in the sanctuary. As well. uh, come in there and join. Listen to him. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, Richard's going to uh, fill in for me. He's going to talk a little bit about Jesus and ministry. And, and just what it means to be a part of that. And uh, uh, it'll be a great time uh, together. We invite you to continue to help support the ministry at North Baptist Church. You can do that by uh, going on the, the Facebook page here to Lifeway by Generosity app, downloading that on your phone or your tablet or your PC. And you can automatically give from wherever you are and uh, donate securely to that. You can mail a check to Ottawa North Baptist Church Post Office Box 117, Ottawa, Kansas, 66067, and uh, put attention to Linda on it, and it'll get right right to her. Uh, whatever it is, whatever your gift is, it's always uh, appreciated. Uh, we thank you for helping support the ministries that we're a part of at North, uh, you know, like the, the food pantry, the, uh, the lighthouse, uh, the Martinez family, uh, uh, His Way, uh, Bethel Christian Academy, uh, Hope House in Ottawa. Uh, many multitudes of things that uh, we're a part of. And so uh, we thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we give praise for you and your life there. And so I encourage you as you start to uh, think about winding down here that you might start to tell everybody uh, goodbye. Uh, 
We'll see you Sunday. And again, we'll see you again next Wednesday night. You know, I don't know if we'll be right here or right somewhere else. So join in, tune in uh, next Wednesday night at, at 7. We'll see you here on Facebook Live from somewhere, uh, wherever that might be. Hey, uh, let, let me pray for us before we close this evening, okay? Uh, Lord, again, we just thank you for the uh, time that we've been able to spend together. And Father, we are so blessed by each and every one that has been a part of this. And Father, I pray this evening that uh, John chapter 2 will be ingrained into their hearts and their lives this week. And it will it will help, it will encourage, it will strengthen. Uh, it, will, it will continue to build their faith on their journey uh, wherever you have each one of us uh, to go. And so, Father, we're just thankful for each one uh, that's been a part of this, uh, that will be a part of the days to come, and we're blessed by your uh, relationship with each one of us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Father, it is about him. It's about the relationship we have with him. And so, Father, we just give you praise for that this evening. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, again this evening, it was good to, uh, to see all of you on. Um, we love you guys. It's, uh, it's, it's been great to be... Uh, out and about, uh, seeing what's going on. We're staying pretty protective in the things we do and the things we, the places we go. And uh, I'm sure as all of you are, uh, but uh, uh, it's exciting. Uh, thank you guys for joining us this evening. Uh, we love you. We will see you next Wednesday night, Facebook Live at 7 and uh, uh, Sunday morning at 1030. So we'll see you. Have a great week. Uh, love you and goodbye.